If you would, open up your Bibles to John chapter 19. We're going to begin at verse 17, and we're going to conclude at verse 30 today. This is our 44th study through the Gospel of John. I know that sounds like a big number, but really it's just a little bit more than a half a chapter a week, which is a lot for the Gospel of John. But there's a sense in which Everything that we've talked about up to this point in the Gospel of John has led to where we're at right now. I mean, Jesus, from the very beginning of his life, his ministry, was focused on what he would do at the cross when he was crucified. It's been a theme all throughout the Gospels, all throughout the Gospel of John specifically, and here we are. You could say that everything prior to the cross looks forward to it. Everything after the cross looks back at it. We are at the critical point right here in the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. After Pontius Pilate passed sentence on Jesus, they led him out in the custom which they did in that day where the man would carry his cross, they would go in a procession and they would not take the most direct route because the Romans wanted this to be a very public display. And so they would take, you know, kind of a wandering route to the place of crucifixion. They would wander through the streets so as many people as possible could see the condemned man, they could read the crime that he was accused of, and they would know this is what happens when you go against the authority and the power of Rome. They made their way eventually to this place in Hebrew that's called Golgotha. In Latin, you would make that Calvary. It means the place of a skull. That's one thing I like about the name of our church. Calvary Chapel. Chapel, a place where people get together and worship and hear God's word. Connected with the place where Jesus was sacrificed. Calvary. They led him there, and then in just a very straightforward manner, there's no manipulation, there's no vivid, gory description given. It just simply says in verse 18 that they crucified him. Again, no great description. Everybody in John's day knew what crucifixion was like. Crucifixion was designed to make the victim suffer publicly, slowly, with great pain and humiliation. And this was the form of death that God the Father ordained that his son should die. When you think about it, there's a lot of different ways. I'm not trying to sound grotesque here, but there's a lot of different ways that a person can be executed. God chose this way, a way of great pain, of great humiliation, of great suffering. Because in that, God himself would do a work. It says there they crucified him. And look at verse 18 where it also says, and Jesus in the center. I can't get that image out of my mind. There's three crosses on Calvary, on Golgotha that day. There's Jesus in the center. There's a thief, a robber, probably a murderer on one side and on the other. He's right there in the middle of them. You see, they did it presumably to to, to make Jesus' suffering worse, to, to, to make him look around and say, see the company of the people that you're dying in? You're just another wretched criminal who deserves to die. It was literally true. There was one cross in the middle of the two, and Jesus was upon that cross. But friends, I can't get it out of my mind that the idea of Jesus being in the center is just such a powerful expression of what Jesus is for all of humanity. I mean, you could say, at the cross, Jesus was centered in all of humanity. When you go through and reconstruct it from the four Gospels and see who was there at the cross, it's an awesome scene. Jesus died among men and women, among Jews and Gentiles, among rich and poor, among high class and no class. He died among the highly educated and those with no education. He died among the religious and the secular. He died among the guilty and the innocent. He died among the weepers and the mockers. He died among those who were deeply moved by what was happening on the cross. And he died among people who didn't care a bit. 
He died in the very center of humanity. You could also say that Jesus was in the center in another way. He was centered among sinful men. You know, there he is. They're supposing, oh, isn't this going to make Jesus feel even worse as he dies? He looks to his right and he looks to his left. There he is, sinners all around him. You know what Jesus would say? He goes, I've been around sinners my whole life. I I came to seek and save the lost. I didn't come to isolate myself from from sinners and just hang around with the holy people. No, no, no. It's the sick who need a physician. There's a couple sick guys on either side of me. I'm the doctor of the soul. This is where I should be. Jesus was centered also between believing and unbelieving. Because we know this. We know this, that one of the men on one side of Jesus, he believed the other one rejected him and died cursing Jesus. But think about the one on Jesus' side who believed. Think about the fact that the last human voice testifying to Jesus was a criminal who was convicted of his crime and who died shortly after Jesus did. Think about the fact that the disciples were all gone. None of them spoke to Jesus' righteousness on the cross. The religious leaders, they were too busy spitting in the face of Jesus to say anything good about him. The Romans, they didn't care. And then when you think about it even more, you think about even those faithful women who were there at the cross, their voices were silenced by grief. They couldn't say anything. But God would say, no, there will be a voice that testifies to the righteousness of my son. I'll get a criminal who trusts in Christ at the very last moment. He will be that last voice that testifies of Jesus. Then you could say that Jesus was also centered between God and man. He wasn't just centered horizontally on the right and the left. He was also centered vertically, up and down. There he is, in the middle between God and man, reconciling man to God. You could also say that Jesus was centered in all human history, in all time. I'm not just pulling out a trick from the preacher's bag of tricks, an exaggeration when I say this, my friends. I say it with utter sincerity and meaning that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the central event in all human history. That everything leading up to it looks towards it. Everything leading back to it looks back to it. There has been no single event that has impacted the world more than this that we read about right here in John chapter 19 when Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross. This is it. It's in the center of everything. So how appropriate is it that in John chapter 19 verse 18 it says that Jesus was in the center. Now let's go on to verse 19. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, There was nothing unusual about having the title of the person, the name, and the crime for which they were crucified attached to the cross. That was normal Roman custom. Matter of fact, when Jesus went to the cross, if they followed normal Roman custom, and it seems like they did, two things I want to correct about your perception about Jesus. The movie that runs in your head, let me do a little editing right now. When Jesus went to the cross and carried the cross, he didn't carry an entire cross. He didn't carry this. Normally, in the Roman world, they left the vertical beam there at the place of crucifixion, and the condemned only carried the horizontal beam, which was heavy enough. But normally, that's the only thing that they carried. The second thing is they would put around their neck a title with their name and the crime that they were convicted of. So Jesus had a sign around his neck as he made his way up to the cross. When they got up there and nailed the person to the cross, they put the sign at the top so everybody could see. This is the guy's name, and this is what he did. And what was Jesus' crime? Notice here, verse 19, the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This is his name, Jesus of Nazareth. This is his crime. He's the King of the Jews. There's a couple things that impact me right away there. First of all, number one, 
Notice how God proclaims the innocence of his son, even at the very end. What does it say on either side of Jesus? You know, the other two guys, they had signs above their crosses too. It said their name and it said, murder, thief. On the other one, it said their name, murder, thief. What does it say about Jesus, king of the Jews? Friends, that's not a crime. Especially if it's true. God's proclaiming the innocence of Jesus. There, there's no crime to commit among, nothing. They didn't even put a false charge up on the cross. God wouldn't allow it so that it could be proclaimed, this is my innocent son. That's one thing to notice. The other thing to notice, and we've emphasized it for you here, it was written in three languages. In Greek, in Hebrew, the Hebrew would have actually been Aramaic. They use the terms interchangeably. In Greek, in Hebrew, and in Latin. You could say that it was written in Hebrew because the Hebrews loved the law. You could say it was written in Greek because the Greeks loved philosophy. It was written in Latin because the Romans loved power. And Jesus triumphed over all of those things at the cross. But notice this as well. It's a message this way because God intended that the message of the cross be spread all throughout the world and into every language. It's not exclusive. In every language. By the way, that's one of the reasons why we're passionate about this project that we have together as a congregation to get the Bible translated into the language of a Saho people. The Saho people are an unreached people group uh, living in Ethiopia and Eritrea. And, and we want to reach them. We want to give them the scriptures in their own language. Why? Because the very beginning of Christianity, the message was broadcast into multiple languages. It didn't start out in English. Not even in King James English. No, but God intended from the very beginning that it would go out to every language. And this, this is our responsibility. It was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. Now verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, for who it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. A Roman crucifixion was always supervised by soldiers. I mean, this was a judicial thing that was being carried out. And since the person would be on the cross for a long time, typically, commonly, a person might be on a cross 24 hours to 36 hours until they died. As a matter of fact, and many people don't understand this, the, the crosses often had a little piece of wood protruding on the bottom section of the cross where the person could almost sit or rest against a little bit. They didn't want them to die too soon. They wanted to end out, extend out the agony, the humiliation, the pain, and the suffering. So the soldiers had to keep peace, they had to make sure there was no mob scene, they had to make sure that the person actually died, they had to supervise the whole thing, so there's soldiers around the cross. They take the clothing of Jesus, and would you please note that, it says there in verse 23, they took his garments. I, I know, and it's appropriate, and it's possible, though, barely possible that Jesus had a dignified loincloth on the cross. Almost certainly not. He was naked. He gave up everything. Everything down to the last stitch of clothing. Now, the Romans did this because the cross wasn't just about making a person die but humiliating them as much as possible. Jesus embraced this humiliation. He voluntarily chose it. Matter of fact, this was so well known that one commentator quotes an ancient saying. He says, they said in the ancient world, naked as a newborn baby or a crucified man. Because everybody knew that's how you crucified people. When I think of Jesus in the humiliation of being naked on the cross, I think of him taking the ladder from heaven all the way down. 
giving up everything. Ladies and gentlemen, he gave up everything at the cross. He gave up the last thread of his clothing for you and I. I like how it says it there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It puts it like this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus looked upon us and he goes, they're poor. They have nothing. He looked at himself. He goes, I have everything. I'm God. I dwell in heaven. I will let go of everything so that they might be rich. He became naked so that we could become clothed. He gave it all up so that we could receive. And then it says that they divided his clothing. Normally there were five parts of clothing to a person that day. So there were four soldiers. Four of the parts they just distributed among themselves. But then they have this one nice tunic that's, that's woven without a seam. It's just one, made out of one piece of fabric. Well, we don't want to tear this up. Let's gamble for it. And that's what it says at the end of those verses, that they were gambling at the foot of the cross. And friends, I can't get that image out of my mind. That there's Jesus dying for the sins of the world. There's an innocent man shedding his blood for you and I. And what are people doing at the foot of the cross? They're gambling. They're playing games. And I would say that in some way it's true today that both outside God's people and even among God's people, people are still playing games at the foot of the cross. You know, um, there's something in us that says, I got to be entertained and stimulated every moment. You know, you know what I'm kind of trying to take and to do? And I'm just trying this. So if you see me out, you know, around town and I'm not doing this, go easy on me. But when I'm waiting for something, I'm waiting for my car. I'm waiting at the bank. I'm waiting at this. I'm waiting somewhere. I'm trying not to do just this. That's what we all do when we have to wait anywhere, right? We're, I don't know, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're just all like this. That's how I am a lot of the time. So more and more, I'm consciously trying to say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put this down, I'll put it in my pocket, and I'm just going to sit and think for a few minutes. It, it can happen. It can really happen. You, you see, I'm, a, I'm afraid that I can get addicted to entertainment and stimulation and that I won't pause and think and that I could be, and and I I don't want to exaggerate, I just mean in a small way, but still in a way that frightens me nevertheless. I can be just, I'm playing at the foot of the cross instead of standing back and saying, Look at what's happening there. I need to think about it. I need to meditate on it. I I need to shut off the outside stimuli just for a moment and just focus for a few moments on God, the Son, pouring out his life for me there on the cross. When you look at it, things will blow your mind. Look at it there, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. When you survey the scene at the cross, there's the religious leaders. They're mocking him. There's the soldiers. Man, they're bored. They're playing dice. But there, there are the faithful women that followed Jesus. The women who had more courage than all but one of Jesus' disciples, they all left. John's the only one of his disciples there. And I think everybody who loved Jesus and looked upon him at the cross, I think every one of them had their own agony. But did any of them have more agony than Mary? I held him as a boy. And here he is now on the cross. And it's not fair, it's not right. You know how it is for us as parents. We only want good for our kids. Man, we want it to be good, and and truth be known, probably more than we should, we want it to be easy and comfortable for them. I mean, if we could spare them a hardship, we'd like to. 
It's not all there is right. Sometimes we know in our head, no, it's good for them to go through this tough time. I had my tough times. It's okay for them to have theirs. But there's something within the parent. You just want to spare your kids as much as you can. Mary goes, I can't spare him. I can't protect him. When Jesus was a little baby and Joseph and Mary brought him to the temple, there was a man named Simeon who took the boy. And he took him and he blessed him. He had been waiting through the Messiah. And here he is, here he is. And he blessed the boy and it was a beautiful time. But then Simeon said this to Mary. It's in Luke chapter 2, verse 35. He said, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Friends, here at the cross, that sword was sharper than ever upon Mary's soul. But you know what else it shows? It shows that Jesus cares about the hurting parent and wants to comfort them. Because what does Jesus do? He can't fix it. He he can't call out to his mom and say, Mom, it's good. It's no problem. It is a problem. It's horrible. But what he can do is he can say, I'm going to bring you whatever comfort I can bring to you. You're going to be taken care of. Mary, mother, that disciple of mine next to you, he's your son. John, that, that woman next to you, she's your mother. Take care of her. And Jesus says, I care for that hurting parent. And my heart goes out to them, even in their great moment of need, and I want to bless them. Now verse 28. Lord, help us now as we look at these verses. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. To get the complete picture of Jesus on the cross, you have to go to all four gospels. And it seems clear that John wrote his gospel after the other three. So are there very clear and very powerful things that Jesus went through on the cross that John doesn't even mention? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John doesn't even mention it. I I really believe, he says, you already read that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You you know that when Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that he was crying out and a holy transaction took place at that moment where God the Father poured out his wrath upon God the Son. What John tells us about is what happened after that was completed. Notice those words that open verse 28, knowing that all things were now accomplished. Look at those words, were now accomplished. There was a point of time at the cross when things were accomplished. Now, if we just apply a little bit of logic to this, if there was a point of time when things were accomplished, then before that things were not yet accomplished, then there was a moment when it was accomplished, and then there was a moment after that when things had already been accomplished. I know it's obvious, but sometimes we just need to be reminded about the most obvious things. There was a moment of accomplishment. There was a time when Jesus actually became the target of God the Father's wrath and judgment of sin. To put it in the terms of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a moment in time when he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's a time when that holy transaction took place. When God actually poured his wrath out upon the son and the son actually received it. And because he was both God and man, he could receive it. He could bear it. He could satisfy it. He could perfectly please the father with his sacrifice on the cross. And when that was done, it was accomplished. It didn't need to be done again. He says, verse 28, knowing that all things were accomplished. Friends, I I don't want to make light of the cross. I hope I say this reverently. But but can we not picture the smallest 
smile of satisfaction upon Jesus' face when he knew that. When at that moment, he comprehended the joy that was set before him. And it's finished. It's done. It was only then that what did he say? Notice the words there in verse 28 that he said, I thirst. Now, earlier in the crucifixion, the Gospel of Mark tells us this. They offered to Jesus a pain-numbing drink. Apparently, there was a group of women, sort of a benevolent society in Jerusalem called the Daughters of Jerusalem. And one of the things they did, just sort of as a benevolent thing, is they would prepare a stupefying, pain-numbing drink, a drug, something like morphine. I don't know if it was chemically like morphine, but the same effect that it would sort of stupefy and space out people on the cross because who would want to go through that with a clear mind? Jesus refused that. No, I'm not taking it. I'm going to go through this with an absolutely clear mind knowing everything that's happening to me. But now that all things were accomplished, he says, can you bring me a little water? Now, it wasn't literally water. It says that it was vinegar. It was wine, very diluted, this thing that the Roman soldiers would commonly drink. It's a very common thing back then. So what do they do? They brought it to him with a little sponge. He wanted to moisten his lip. He wanted to clear his throat. Why? Because he had something very important to say. And he didn't want to say it in a whisper. It says in one of the other gospels that he said this with a loud cry. And what did he cry out nice and loud and strong? Look at it right there in verse 30. It is finished. Actually, it's three words in English. In the ancient Greek, it was one word. Tetelestai. That's it. One word. And what it means, it means that Jesus was on the cross as a winner. He finished the eternal purpose of the cross. And it means that today the cross stands as the testimony of God's complete, finished work. That word to telestai, it really was in the ancient world used as an accounting term. When everything added up, when everything was paid in full on the debt, you could write across it to telestai. Jesus said, finished, completed. Paid in full. It's done. It's all accomplished. And I want the whole world to know it. Friends, sometimes a single word can change everything. You stand before the judge. You're going to hear the word guilty. You just want to know, am I also going to hear the word not? Not can be a pretty important word right there. Uh, You play in a baseball game. The ball gets hit. A single word. Fair. Fair can matter everything in the game. A man proposes to a woman for marriage. A single word makes a pretty big difference there, doesn't it? Yes or no. Sometimes a single word changes everything, and this word, tetelestai, it changed it all because at some point before he died, before the veil was torn, before he cried out, it is finished, an awesome spiritual transaction took place. God the Father laid upon God the Son all the guilt and wrath that our sin deserved, and he bore it in himself perfectly. He totally satisfied the justice of God. And so it was all finished. It was all paid in full. It was all accomplished. The types, the promises, the prophecies, all finished. The sacrifices and the ceremonies of the priesthood, all finished. The the perfect obedience of the Son of God, all complete. The satisfaction of God's justice, it's finished. The power of Satan, of sin and of death, it's done. It's finished. It's triumphed over. And so at the end of it all, what did he do? Look at it, verse 30. He bowed his head. Now, we don't pick it up from the English, but in the original language, it has the idea of laying your head down peacefully in sleep. You know, bowing your head, it could be in defeat, in dejection. Oh, I lost. No, no, no. This is a peaceful laying down of the head. Very peaceful, very calm. My work is done. Please, friends, I mean this reverently. I don't need to hang around here any longer. It's done. You know, it kind of shows us that Jesus was not, and please, I, I hope I speak this reverently, Jesus was not a masochist. He's not like, oh, I love to suffer. When it was finished, he was done. He's out of there. He suffered everything that was necessary, but not one bit more. When it was done, when it was finished, when he proclaimed it to the world, He bowed his head, and then look at it there. It's the last words of our text here for this morning. Verse 30 says, he gave up his spirit. 
It doesn't say he died, which he did. He gave up his spirit. Why does it describe it that way? Because Jesus died in a way unlike any other human being. In a manner unlike any man or any other woman, he gave up his spirit. Death had no righteous hold over Jesus. If you've been born with a sin nature or you've ever committed sin, death has a claim over you. Anybody in this room fulfill that description? I'll say amen for myself, okay? Jesus was not born with a sin nature and he never committed sin. Death had no righteous hold over him. He had to voluntarily and consciously yield his life to death. And so he bowed his head. It says that he gave up his spirit. It was really a fulfillment of what he said in John chapter 10, where he said, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Nobody's going to take it from me. Not you, Romans. Not you, religious leaders. Forget it. You can't take it from me. But I can and will voluntarily yield it. And that's what Jesus did. He could do it because it was finished. Do you believe that, friends? At the end of it all, it's a finished work. His rescue towards us is finished. But notice this. The character of our God is that he's a God who finishes things. We are not exactly like God in that regard, are we? I'm not. You come to my house and you'll see a variety of unfinished projects. Some of them, uh, they will be finished someday. Others, I may as well just clear the plug on them, just pull them away. They're never going to get finished. Our God is a God who finishes things. And his finished work builds in us a heart and a desire for us to finish. How about this? He who has begun a good work in you will complete it, will finish it until the day of Christ Jesus. You will be one of God's finishers as Jesus works in, his lo- in your life. I'm assured of it. Now let me end with this last point. I think about this and I think about a, a story I heard about a guy a German aristocrat, a nobleman from the 16th century. His name was Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Zinzendorf was actually a very important historical character. He was a leading figure in some of the great revivals that spread over Europe in that period of time. But this is how he came to Christ. He came to Christ because he was a wealthy, influential, you know, just, in, man, he'd fit in great in Santa Barbara today. Right now, I mean, he, he just fit right in great. Zinzendorf had graduated from his university. He was doing a tour of Europe as, as wealthy, privileged men did in that day. And he was going around an art museum, and it was in Dresden, I believe, that he saw this art museum. And he looks at it, and he sees a picture. And the picture is of Jesus with a crown of thorns, with a, with, with a, a pierced side, with pierced hands. And this is what it said. All this I have done for you, what will you do for me? Changed his life. He said, man, I can't go back and just live the way. I can't just live the track I'm on. Jesus did this for me. It commands some kind of response. And the only response I can give is to give everything for him as well. All this he has done for you. And he did it for you. You don't have to do it for him. But it must awaken within you and I a response that says, here's what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to believe. I'm going to love you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to look to you and not to me. And I'm going to give my life to spread this message and to reach a needy world in Jesus' sake. All this he has done for you. What will you do for him? Father in heaven, thank you for doing it all. Thank you that it is a finished work. Thank you that you could cry out to tell us, die, and mean it. So now, Lord, we come reverently to the foot of the cross. and We say, Jesus, do your work in us. We love you. We praise you. 
we worship you not only as the crucified one, but as the conqueror, as the victor, as the one who completed all things. We praise you for it all, Lord, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.